This week, politics in the long march towards victory. First section of this week is a continuation of the battle at Princeton. On the 16th, the two forces go at it. But the Union takes heavy losses against the Confederacy, and Cox's division is not making any headway. On the 17th, the Union is once again bested. Rear General Cox and his Kanawha division has to withdraw. Humphrey Marshall has won. The Union lost 113 men to the Confederate 16. Also on the 16th and 17th, mail! Headquarters, Richmond. May 16, 1862. General Thomas J. Jackson. Banks has fallen back to Strasbourg, and the Manassas Gap Railroad is in running order. Banks may intend to move his army to the Manassas Junction, and march thence to Fredericksburg. It is very desirable to prevent him from going either to Fredericksburg or to the peninsula. Successful blow struck at him would delay, but does not prevent his moving to either place. General Yule telegraphed yesterday that in pursuance of orders... From you, he was moving down the valley, and has ordered his troops at Gordonsville to cross the Brew Ridge by way of Massing Courthouse and Fisher's Gap. Whatever you do against Banks, do it quickly. Create the impression that you design threatening the line of the Potomac. I'm General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, R. E. Lee, General. Old General Robert E. Lee has grown anxious of the current situation. Major General Jackson's role in the valley is to ensure that the Union can't send reinforcements to the peninsula and McClellan. And while he's been overall successfully so far doing so, he hasn't landed strong victories, and has always been taking more losses than he inflicts. It isn't sustainable. Richmond, May 17th, 1862. General. There is much determination that the ancient and honored capital of Virginia, now the seat of the Confederate government, shall not fall into the hands of the enemy. Many say rather, would it be a heap of ashes? To you, the defense must be made outside the city. The question is where and how. You may proceed directly here. Your policy, as you stated in our last interview, seems to me to require no modification. But if, as reported here, the enemy should move toward James River, meet him as he moves. My design is to suggest not to direct, recognizing the impossibility of any one to decide in advance, reposing confidently as well on your ability as on your zeal, it is my wishes to leave you with the fullest powers to exercise your judgment. Very respectfully yours, Jefferson Davis. Confederate President Jefferson Davis is in a predicament. Old General Joseph E. Johnston is on the retreat, and the Confederacy looks like it's crumbling. Davis and Johnston are not good friends. It feels like both are just seconds away from finding each other and not the Union. While the letter is polite, the message is clear. Turn around do your duty, and fight. And on the 19th, influential Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts gives a long speech. Here is just an excerpt. I have said what I have to say on the law of this matter. Bring it to the touchstone of the Constitution and of international law. It is for you now to determine out of which you will draw, or, indeed, if you will not draw from both. Regarding the rebels as criminals, you may so pursue and punish them. Regarding them as enemies, you may blast them with that summary vengeance, which is among the dread agencies of war. While, by an act of inefficient justice, you may elevate a race, change this national calamity into a sacred triumph. Or regarding them both as criminals and as enemies, you may marshal against them all the double penalties of rebellion and of war, or better still, the penalties of rebellion, and the triumphs of war. Mr. President, you seek indemnity for the past and security for the future. You seek the national unity under the Constitution. Here's the way in which all these can be surely obtained. Strike down the leaders of the rebellion and lift up the slaves. Then there will be indemnity from the past, such as no nation ever before was able to win. And there will be a security for the future, such as no nation ever before enjoyed. While the Republic, glorified and strengthened, will be assured forever, one and indivisible. On the 20th, a campaign promise is fulfilled. The Homestead Act is signed into law. For any citizen, and those who have so filed his declaration of intention to become such, are titled to acquire public land to build their homes on. That was a major Republican campaign promise, and was firmly opposed by many lower South politicians who are no longer in Congress. The lands out west are very low in population, so Lincoln is killing many birds with one stone. 
poor unemployed farmers, lands without people to work on, political support. So a cruel effect of this act will be the pushing of Native Americans off of their ancestral lands. What are they going to do? Open up a war against the U.S. while the Union is already fighting a war? Or by forcing Lincoln to split his forces and weaken his position against the Confederates, while raiding settler homes to continue to supply their forces, hoping to wade out the desperate Union as it fights for its survival? Nah. And throughout the week, the Siege of Corinth continues. Both sides continue to dig in. The Confederates come up with a plan of attack, and then they don't do it. Major General gives Major General Grant gives advice to Major General Halleck, and he says no. The siege has been one without assaults or battles, and is driving everyone in the camp a little bit insane. Halleck finds it better to lose little and allow the enemy to escape than to risk battle. The Confederates are in no position but to wait, wait, and wait, and then there is Sickles. He arrives at camp. The evening parade is ready. And he walks near. There is a great cheer. But it's quieter than the last cheers he's received. He sees the gaps in the regiments. The friends lost. And tears hit the ground. He goes up to the 71st New York. His baby takes their colors and kisses them. He has returned home. That's where the week ends. And I won't lie. It's a slow one. From the minor skirmish to the repeated letters to the never-ending speeches to the never-ending sieges. Nothing is happening. There is anxiety in the air. Something has to happen. And it has to happen soon. Neither side can go on like this. When will this end? Hello. This is the entire Civil War Week by Week team here. I just want to say thank you for the thousand subscribers. And hopefully a thousand more fall into this trap. If you liked the video, please like it. If you want to tell me how much you liked it, please comment. If you want to see more, you should be seeing playlists, recommended videos, and a button to subscribe if you don't want to go to the one down below. It has been an honor reporting this very old news to you. And I'll see you next week.